Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning to everyone that's tuning in and would like to hear the opening prayer this morning from our brother Tom Thompson in Colorado. Good morning, everyone. Let's bow our heads before the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this time together. Thank you that we are able to worship and learn from you. Bless Bart as he brings the message this morning. Give him the words that you want us to hear. Strengthen each of us, Lord. Open our hearts. Guide and direct. You know the difficulties and the issues that come into all of our lives. And I just ask for your hand in everyone's life here, Lord. Guide this service this morning and be with those who have other parts in it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tom. I don't know if Bart said anything about being down here, but we have been spoiled rotten with nature. And we we saw spoonbills, we've seen manatees, we did surfing on the beach. We have been eating all kinds of great seafood in 80 degree weather. And we have just been so treated by Craig. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Sally. And I'm telling you what, everybody could use a dose of Craig medicine because Bart and I have laughed so hard the last few days with Craig's, we all know Craig's stories. So I just wanted to say thank you, Craig. So Heather, would you bless us with a song this morning? Good morning, house family. Uh, this morning I'll be singing, this is the day that the Lord has made and also I've got a river of life. So if you know these songs, I welcome you to sing with me. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up a well. Within my soul, spring up a well and make me whole. Spring up a well and give to me that life abundantly. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Thank you. Hey, Aaron, I want to say it's really yeah. good to see you this morning. That you're feeling better. Thank you. You're welcome. Good to see you, Jeremiah. Okay, we're going to do prayer time now. Tom, you can lead us in prayer. Thank you. And I will be bringing it up on the share screen. The word for this week and the focus of the message this morning is the word road. Ponder this thought. The Lord of life meets us on the road of life. Let's practice this. Let our hearts not burn within us while he talked to us on the road. Tom? Thank you. Let's prayer, have a prayer, time of prayer. Let's start out with some praises for things that the Lord has done. 
God, we thank you for working all things together for the good in Johnny and her family as they're finally closed on their new home in Colorado and for a new job for her husband. Thank you for the Munson family and for their road to recovery after a bout with COVID. Thank you for House Church and the Disciplers International Ministry teams that are now in operation. Guide them, Lord, and be with each of these praises. Lord, we ask for a complete end to the COVID-19 pandemic and all the various variants worldwide. Help our leaders as they develop and disseminate uh, vaccines to help control this situation, Lord. We thank you. We ask for the Munson family as they continue to their recovery from COVID-19. Lord, we pray for Whiskey Bob to recover from the health issues that he's had this week, requiring his hospitalization. Strengthen him, guide him, and encourage him, O oh Lord. We pray for Johnny's boys as they start in their new school this week. And Brother Andy, and Johnny's brother Andy, that he would find better employment. We ask for Flavian and Naomi as they visit a niece whose husband passed away and for all who grieve in this loss. Be with them and enlighten and encourage their hearts, Lord. We pray for God's blessing on Adrian's son-in-law who is starting a new ministry at a Lutheran church in South Carolina. And Lord, we ask that you would be with him as he's been exposed to COVID and ask that you would strengthen him and work through him. We pray for Julie, whose sister Tina has been diagnosed with stage three cancer and is struggling with the effects of chemo. Just be with her, Lord, and lift her spirit. For Brian, a colleague of Heidi's whose mom passed away, and for the opportunity for Heidi to share her faith with him, guide and direct her words and her actions, Lord. We pray for Edward Reedson as he continues to apply for full-time employment in Malawi and others in need of jobs there, Lord. Just reach down and touch these people. We pray for Jonathan and Mary that they would find interim furnished housing in Annapolis after following their graduation. Guide them, Lord, as they start their new life together. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Hear our prayers and guide each one. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Let us pray to the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Lynn Sandy from Annapolis, Maryland will be bringing us first scripture reading. And Aaron from South Carolina will bring us the second. Thank you. The first reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 32. They drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Our second reading comes from Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 10 in the New International Version. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, 
arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Titus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, everyone. And now we have a little short story from Brother Craig uh, right in the other room where Don and I have been staying for the last few days. And we've heard lots of stories from Craig. This is one that he did recently, and he's putting these on YouTube. So I'm going to make those available, some of the past ones as well. But this one he shared with us the other day, and I said, Craig, you need to share that on Sunday. So here it is. Craig? This story is about a, a farmer that lives in the Adirondack Mountains. And he, he works hard. He's a hard working farmer. And he wanted some, to do something while he wasn't working. He needed a hobby. So he decided that he was going to pan for gold. So he goes into town, and goes to the hardware store, asks the man behind the counter for a shovel and a pan. And the man says, what in the world do you want with a shovel and a pan? He says, I'm going to pan for gold. He said, son, there ain't no gold in Pennsylvania. And he said, well, I'm going to try anyway. So he went on to the house and he got into the creek and he began to pan for gold. And he went every Saturday, four or five weeks and didn't find a thing, but he was enjoying his time in the creek, in the wilderness. And then one Saturday morning, he was panting. And all of a sudden, he saw some shine. And he panted a little bit more, and that nugget just kept getting bigger and bigger. And he got so excited, he took it, he put it in his pocket. And now he was panting with some serious enthusiasm. Well, later on in the day, there was a man and his son walking down the trail. And they saw him over there in the creek panting. And they said, hey, what are you doing? He said, I'm panning for gold. They said, there ain't no gold in Pennsylvania. And he said, well, I found a little something this morning. And they came a-running. As they approached, he noticed that the little boy's shoes was pretty tore up. And the man's clothes were a lot less than new. But he held out that piece of gold nonetheless. And that little boy said, wow, dad, that's the prettiest thing I ever seen in my life. Can I touch it? And the farmer put the gold right in his hand. And the boy just looked at it. He was just amazed by it. And the farmer says, you know what? Why don't you take that with you? And the dad said, no, we can't do that. He said, sure you can. I want you to have it. Well, sure enough, they took it and went on their way, and the farmer did his thing, and every Saturday, he'd go back, and he'd be panning for gold. You know, he never did find any more gold. One Saturday, the man came back without his child, and he walks up to the young farmer, and he said, you know, I got a question for you, and he said, what's that, sir? He said, why would you give me that gold nugget? Do you have any idea what that thing was worth? I had it appraised, and it had substantial value. And the young man said, praise God. That's awesome. But I, but I want you to have it. See, God's been real good to me, and I really don't have a need. And I was just doing it for a hobby, and I ain't never found none since. So I believe the Lord had me doing this to give it to you from the very beginning. And the old man, give him a hug. And he went on his way. You know, in life, as we go through it, if we'll just look around, be aware, God will use us if we allow him to. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Craig, for sharing. That story makes me think about the road that we're all on. And on this road of life, 
God gives us a lot of experiences and a lot of blessings. And the greatest blessing of all, of course, is that gift of gold he gives us. It's that priceless gold of himself in his son. And he wants us to give away what we've got. And that's what that story Craig was just sharing is all about, giving away the best that we've got to others just because we have it. And if we have it, it's ours to give. So let's give. Father, thank you for the gift of life that you give us on this road of life. Help us to be grateful, most grateful, so grateful that we want to share what you've given us. And what's amazing about it is when we give away what we've got, you give us more. It's just very unusual. We think mostly about giving things away and then we have less, but when we give away what you give us, we get much more in return. So open our eyes to those opportunities along the way and help us to be generous with others, just as you are generous with us in Christ. Amen. The road, we're on the road, aren't we? Well, there's a song written about a road and it became very, very famous, but it's very interesting how that song came to be. So Willie Nelson was doing his first uh, headline movie. Now the movie didn't end up being very successful, but the song that went with the movie became incredibly successful. The movie was Honeysuckle Rose, and it was about this aging musician who was traveling around and he was singing at various venues. He was just the guy who had done this a long time, but he had never quite made it to the top. And as he traveled around with his band, which was comprised uh, largely of family members, it's the journey along the way. So that was the movie, Honeysuckle Rose. Well, when Willie Nelson was on an airplane, um, the executive producer was also on a plane and he came up to Willie and said, hey, Willie, um, we need a song. Could you come up with a song for this show? And so Willie said, well, what's it about? And he says, well, it's about being on the road. And right there on the spot, as the story goes, uh, Willie thought for a minute, he says, you mean something like on the road again? Just can't wait to get on the road again? And the producer said, yeah, 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 something like that. And what would be the melody that would go with that? Willie said, well, I don't have a melody for it yet. You know, just let me think about it. So on the airplane, on an air sickness bag, as it says in the story that goes with this song, he wrote the words, on the road again. Just can't wait to get on the road again. The life I love, playing music with my friends, just can't wait to get on the road again, on the road again. Seeing sights I've never seen before. Doing things I'll never do again. Just can't wait to get on the road again. Those are the first two stanzas and it just kind of went from there and became a huge hit. But I find it just fascinating about this song about being on the road again. I, I like that opening, on the road again. The life I love is making music with my friends. It's not that the case. What is it like to make music with your friends? I'm not necessarily talking about music with instruments. Uh, you know, I don't play an instrument. I don't have a fantastic voice like Heather does and others, but it's, it's the music of life. It's what Dawn and I have been experiencing for the last few days with Sally and Craig Kennedy on the road. We've been on the road down here a good bit, seeing a lot of different sites. But what's been most special for us is to be with friends. And you know, it's really amazing about our experience in house churches. We've got folks from all over the place. Maybe we ought to get on the road once in a while and see one another. I had that opportunity with Mike Heimer and John Cockman in Kansas, who I hadn't seen for almost 50 years. And it was through house church that got us together. I'm looking forward to those connections with people on the road of life. Well, after the Christmas season from Thanksgiving on through the Advent season into 
the new year, we have stepped out of the book of Acts for a while for a good reason. Well, we're stepping back in. It's been a while. But the book of Acts is all about being on the road. And when we think about that road, especially for the uh, early disciples, the Apostle Paul is much of that picture and that story right now. Let's think about the road that God has us on as well. So as we pick up again in this new year, we're picking up on the third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And I'm going to give you kind of a once over the world because in this chapter, chapter 19, there is so much going on. We could park in all kinds of places and do all kinds of messages about what's happening, but I don't have time for that, and you don't have time for that, but we can get uh, I can, a big picture of what it is being on that road, joining with him and thinking about the road that we're on as well. Well, chapter 18 ends with the Apostle Paul heading back to Antioch. He's finishing up his second missionary journey, and he takes this couple that he's been spending time with, a missionary couple named Priscilla and Aquila. And on their way, they stop in Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is an amazing city. Even the ruins of Ephesus, years ago, when about a year after I met Craig on my second first uh, assignment to Germany, Don and I were living over there. Just before we left, we did a trip. And the trip was called the Footsteps of Paul in Western Turkey. And we went through Ephesus. So we were there. So as I'm reading about this place, my mind goes back to, and I would encourage you to read about this city, what was going on there, and take a look at some of the pictures. The ruins are just amazing. So he stayed there for a little while, but he had to leave. They wanted him to stick around longer, and he says, hey, I'll come back and see you if I can in time. So he left, ended up back in Antioch after that trip for maybe about a year. Now, meanwhile, somebody else shows up, in Ephesus. His name is Apollos. He is an eloquent man. He speaks well, and he knows the scriptures, but like any one of us, he just knows what he knows, and while he is there, he is speaking what he does know about Jesus, but it's limited to the John, the Baptist. He had heard about John and his message, but he didn't know a whole lot more. John pointed, of course, to Jesus, and so Priscilla and Aquila there help him out and teach him more accurately. And he becomes a very powerful spokesman for the Lord there for a little while in Ephesus. And then he leaves because he has a heart to get on the road. Well, this road would be on a boat going over to Corinth in Achaia, which is southern Greece. And that's where God has led him to go. So meanwhile, the Apostle Paul is on his way from Antioch going west. And he's stopping at those places on this road again. He's been on it twice already, visiting folks he hasn't seen for a long time. And I can only imagine what those experiences must have been like. I don't think that was as much church planting as it was renewing relationships, encouraging folks that he had invested in before. And when he gets to the place of city in Antioch, roughly about that area, he hadn't traveled west from there before. Not on the second journey, but if you go straight west, you'll get to Ephesus, and that's where he ends up. Remember, he said, you know, if I can see you again, I will, and he shows up there. Now, while he is in Ephesus, and he's there a good while, that road kind of stops there for a bit, there's all kinds of ups and downs. Do you know that there are roads that we're on when we're in one place? I mean, just going to work every day is a road that takes you into certain encounters and experiences. Sometimes they're up and sometimes they're down. If I said, hey, have you had a good day today? Well, it's been a little up and down. And that's the way it was for the Apostle Paul in Ephesus. So it, very interesting when he got there, he found some disciples. We assume they're disciples of Jesus, but it doesn't appear so as the story unfolds. And uh, there are some disciples, and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, well, we never heard about the Holy Spirit. He says, really? So in what or in whom were you baptized? He said, well, we were baptized in John, John's baptism. Paul says, well, that's the baptism of repentance, but 
He's the one who is pointing to Jesus. And so he tells them the rest of the story, just like Apollos got the rest of the story from Priscilla and Aquila, just like some people will get the rest of the story from you and me on the road. And when they hear it, they're baptized. He lays his hands on them, prays for them, and voila, something happens that we don't see recorded very often in Scripture, but it happens there where they're speaking in tongues and they're prophesying that it happened in Acts 2 with all the apostles there together. Peter was there, of course. It happened again in Acts 10 where Cornelius, who is not a Jew, same thing as happening here. What, what is going on? Well, the Holy Spirit has come, and this is the way he manifested himself. And that's, that's a high road. That's an up. Well, what goes on from there is Paul goes to the synagogue. You know, he's been down that road before. In fact, early on, uh, when he would bring the gospel there, because what they already believed, they would reject it. Some wouldn't, but some would. And sometimes he was run out of town, sometimes barely escaping with his life. But he had a heart for his people, just like you do. You ever have some family problems and you just want to get away? Yeah, I'm done with you. I'm done. One time too many, but then a little later, you're, you're back because you can't stop loving those that are a part of your family. It's hard. It was hard for Paul. And so there he is, and the same thing happens that had happened before. Many opposed him vehemently. And what's really interesting here is that they said they were blaspheming the way. The way is used twice in Acts 19 and other places, but it's very likely that the early Christian movement was called the way. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, what is a way? A way is a road. It's a road. They were opposing the way. Jesus is the road. The road to where? Jesus is the road to the Father, to life everlasting. That's the roadway, and they opposed it. I think that's so interesting that he is called the way and they oppose the way, and that's a downer. So on that road, Paul had an upswing and then it's down. And so what's he going to do with this? They're rejecting. What do you do when people don't want to hear what you have to say? Don't want to believe what you believe? Well, sometimes you just got to move on. And he did. He didn't move away from Ephesus at this point, but he went out. And he found a place in town to meet with these disciples, probably some of which were those that had believed in the, in the message of John the Baptist, who had come to faith through Paul and Christ. And he was growing them. He really had a heart to develop them. And so he stepped away from the opposition, and he found opportunity. That's a good thing to do. Move away from the opposition to the opportunities. Well, where are they? Well, they're on the road. Just keep your eyes open, and uh, he'll show you, and sometimes it'll be a surprise. So for two years, Paul is bringing this message, and, he, and it says that everybody in that known area and beyond heard the truth. So evidently, the doors were open, and as he was helping them to grow, they heard about what Paul was saying. Other people wanted to hear, and they came and heard. Amazing things happened on this road to developing this early group of believers and miracles were going on. And we don't see that happening everywhere in the scripture, but it happened there especially. I mean, even some of the things that Paul was wearing, people could just get close to it or touch it. This amazed some of the folks and they wanted more of what he was offering. Now, why was God doing what he was doing like that there and maybe not other places? Well, Ephesus is quite a place. It's an amazing city. Uh, it's a cosmopolitan place. When I was there with Craig, you can't see the, the, the sea from Ephesus anymore, but you used to. You used to be able to pull boats up there. It's all been silted in a couple of miles or more out, going out, but it was a cosmopolitan city. The biggest one in the area, uh, an epicenter for commerce and trade and ideas and thinking. And it was also the home of the temple of Artemis, the goddess. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world way back then. 
And so it drew a lot of attraction and there were all kinds of people that were into the magic arts, even Jewish people, Jewish exorcists and some of that was going on. And they were always calling upon a higher power or some source like a, like a genie or a jinn, uh, like the Aladdin's lamp, you call on this uh, genie out of the bottle. And if you can name him, you can control him. That was some of their thinking. And they're seeing what Paul is doing in the name of Jesus. And so some of them are calling out evil spirits, calling them out and saying, I call you out in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Well, God's not going to have that happening because that's as though he is just another one of many who can do certain things, kind of like Moses in Egypt and all the deities they had. What God did in those 10 plagues was take their deities and show I'm greater than all of them. And so there's that one strange episode with the uh, man named uh, the sons of Sceva, they are, and he uh, claims to be a high priest, maybe just re related to a high priest, but he has, has, has power and, and, and things are happening and his sons are calling upon the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches and this evil spirit on one occasion says, well, I recognize Jesus, I know who Paul is, but who are you? And he jumps all over them, and crazy things happen. But what results from that is the power of God in Christ. It becomes evident to these people who are steeped in magic and the magic arts, and they are blown away, literally. So much so that they recognize where the truth lies in the one true living God, and they begin burning their books, their magic arts and acts. It's a huge bonfire. It says that 50,000 pieces of silver worth of materials are burned. Well, one piece of silver is a day's wages. That's 50,000 days wages. That's roughly 150 years of employment. Can you imagine people giving that up? That sounds like a real high point in this road. Up, down, up, and this is an up, but of course, all of this is coming to the uh, people who are making money off of this goddess, Artemis. God, by the way, God, the goddess Artemis is the Greek word Artemis for the Roman deity Diana. But they have a spin on Diana, and they've made Diana and this, this Artemis, who is the fertility goddess, and that's why there are many prostitutes. And there are many priestesses that work there, and they're making their living. A lot of people, the artisans are making their living. And when they're burning all this stuff, they, Paul is cutting into their economy. And when you touch somebody at the wallet, people get angry. And a guy named Demetrius, he gets really angry, and he shares it with his other craftsmen, and they're coming after Paul. Well, a whole big mob scene forms, and the mob scene ends up in the theater, the theater there is the amphitheater. I've been in it. It holds about 25,000 people. It's craziness going on there. It says most of the people don't even know what they're doing there, but they're arresting and, and, and pulling away some of the people that Paul has traveled with. And finally, Paul is wanting to go in there too. But wisely, he has some guys says, no way, you can't go in there. And so he doesn't. And the town clerk, which is well, like the head official for civic rule and authority and uh, making sure that things don't get out of control. He calms everything down and says, hey, if you got some problems, take it to the court. There's no need for this. So everything settles down. And at the end of that, right after that, at the end of the chapter, Paul says, well, it's time to leave. <laughs> it's time to go on the road again. And so he leaves town and probably it's a good thing because if they get a hold of him, probably lynch him. And it's interesting, again, on his road, just like our road, there's ups and downs. One of the things that was striking to me in all of this is Paul, in the midst of his couple of years or so in Ephesus, he says, you know, I have a mind to go to Rome. Where do you have a mind to go? Where does God want to take you with his message? Where is God taking house church with this message. I'd like to talk for list a little bit about this road that house church has been on since March, the end of March, 
two years ago. So we're going on two years now as we're into this new year, 2018 when we started. Thanks to Heidi, uh, her idea, and Heidi and Gary have tuned in today, and it's great to have them on board. But just as we started when COVID was hitting, and here we have still COVID effects in big way all the way around our country and world. And uh, a long time ago, uh, Heidi had asked me, and others have too, so so where, where, where will this go? How long? And I said, well, I didn't get this started. Um, so I'm not going to be the one who stops it. Let's just see where this is headed. That's really hard for me. Do you like to know where you're going? I do. Do you know, like to know where the road is heading, where the way is going? Well, God has given us a way. And when we're on the way, hand in hand with Jesus, like I talked about last week, just put your hand in his and ours joined together. You know, it's very interesting. In the very first chapter of the Gospel of John, we have the first question asked of Jesus um, and asked by Jesus. So he's walking along, and two followers of John the Baptist, by John's direction, are told, hey, go. He's the one. So there's Jesus with no following at all, but now there's two guys behind him. And when he turns around, he asks this question, what do you seek? What do you want? Now, he could be asking you that question or me that question as well. What do you seek? What do you want? I think it caught them off guard. So they asked him, where are you staying? Could be asked like this. So where are you going? Which way, where are you going? Jesus answers the question very interesting in a cryptic sort of a way and makes me wonder, would I be inclined to continue to follow or not? He simply says, come and see. Come and see. He didn't tell them exactly where in terms of physical location they would end up. Maybe he didn't even know. Life was unfolding. And isn't life unfolding for us? How often do you ask somebody or be asked the question, Hey, what are you going to do today? Where are you going to go? Well, where are we going as House Church 2.0? One of the things that we've just started recently is uh, forming some teams, a house church team to help us with these services on Sunday. So it's not just uh, Bart and Dawn, you know, putting things together. And we do have others that are helping in the process, but we, we need a shared experience as God continues to open the door in this way for us to travel down as a house church community. Another one of those is our website. Another one is our finance team, which is a great team that's working, working in conjunction with Disciples International and uh, the disciple making work. But another one is a mission team. We've got a lot of really great work going on in Africa. I've only been there one time to visit the Reeds since for the first time seven years ago in Africa. And I haven't even met uh, Flavian and Naomi personally face-to-face -face in DRC, but we've got work going on there. So I've been praying over the last couple of months, Lord, um, need some help. Um, someone, a family, uh, you know, to, to come along and, and, and help with uh, what's happening. I can't do all that. I'm not getting any younger and um, I would love to see others engaged and involved. And sometimes uh, the response comes in ways that are way beyond my expectation. I got a text message not too many weeks ago from a friend, young man that I discipled when he was just coming into the army and now he's just getting ready to retire 22 years later. And he says, hey, Bart, What's going on in Malawi? And I responded. And uh, over the last couple of weeks or so, this has been moving really fast. I'll share more about that when I know more. Where is it going? Can't say for sure. Um, it seems to be moving in a direction. And I just want to give you a little taste of it, uh, just to kind of make you wonder and think about what might be happening, but also to pray for us as we are looking for God's direction along this way and along this road to life with him. And how, as Paul, as I'm sorry, as Craig had shared earlier in that his little story, that gold that he gives us to give it away, 
that may be coming in the form of a mission um, opportunity unfolding. And I've got to say that I like to try to figure it all out when I've got whatever I have in the moment. And God is saying, no, wait, just wait. Let's just walk together. Your hand in mine, mine in yours. And we'll take it step by step along this way, on this road, with him and with one another. And as we do that, we need to remember that journey is with Jesus. And our commitment to him is based upon his commitment first to us. And so if you're part of this community of faith in general, and I'm talking about part of the body of Christ as a whole, if you committed your life to Christ, if you've been baptized, if you are a follower, if he is your Savior and Lord, then you're part of the family. And in a way, we're all on the same road. He may give us little trails along the way, but he is the road. and We're going to join with him right now, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, in that upper room as we celebrate again together, communion, coming together in union with Christ, our leader, who is the way. So remembering on that night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Take this, all of you, and eat it. And as often as you do this, remember me. The body of Christ given to us, like that gold that was given to the boy, who gave himself away. Let us receive in his name. Then Jesus took the cup, the cup that was filled with wine. There were four cups there in the Passover Seder. And this was the cup of redemption that he happened to take. And he made it the redemption ultimately that would be not in the blood of a lamb year after year, but in the blood of the lamb. He said, this is my blood. It is of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take this, all of you, and drink it. And as often as you do this, remember me. The blood of our Lord who gives us life. Lord Jesus, you are the one who said, I am the way. You are the road. And when we were on you, in you, and you in us, the journey is an adventure. It's unfolding day by day, step by step, and uh, it's filled with all kinds of ups and downs. But with you, there is consistency, the consistency of your love your fellowship, your friendship, and the friendship that we share with one another. May we experience it evermore. And on this road, Lord, help us as we receive whatever it is that you give us to generously share it with others in the name that is above every name, your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad that I was able to cover that ground with a bit of time for discussion because I have not been given enough time for our discussion afterwards. And this is where we come together and we share. And there was a lot going on in that chapter, wasn't there? I've just got a couple of questions and let it go from there. And uh, the first one is simply based upon what you heard, and there was a lot. I know in that story. Do you have any questions about what was going on? Something that maybe I need a little bit more clarity there. I'm a little perplexed about that. Any questions? I kind of am curious um, how 
So the man, they beat up, the spirit overcame the men and beat them to a pulp. And how did, <laughs> I'm curious, did, do you think that the other people um, out of fear burned their books and everything? Or what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Like, yeah, um, I don't think so. I don't think people would have, I, I'm just thinking to myself, this is my livelihood. This is your background. They had discovered something that was more powerful than they had. And that was what their business was about. They were burning their amulets, uh, their incantations, and those kinds of discoveries have been found in Ephesus. There was lots of them. And when they burned them, they were changing their lives. Their lives were changed. And uh, no, I think it's, it's definitely a real break from this is the true God. And of course, that is what hurt the business of Artemis. People would not be buying those little shrines, those little, you know, figures in silver um, objects and things like that. That hurt their trade. That's what I'm convinced of. Any other Lord, I have a question, too? Um, okay, so in starting in verse 23, they, you know, they had the shrines, they had the little religious artifacts. So you stay away from those, but then you go to uh, verse uh, 12. And now you got, you got Paul and you got Christ. And now we got handkerchiefs and aprons. What's the difference of handkerchiefs and aprons that were being taken to the sick? So <laughs> were they, yeah. these artifacts, artifacts helping, I mean, uh, were they healing people too? I, that's that's a little little thing I was thinking about. I was wondering. Um, what it was. The, the only other place we see something like that is Jesus on his way in response to someone's request to heal someone, and there's this woman who has uh, a hemorrhage that's been going on for twelve years, and she says, "If I can just get close enough and touch the hem of his garment," and when she does, he feels the power go out of her. It's not like the garment was magic; or any object is. But her faith was reaching out to him. That's what she was thinking. And I think in the same sort of a way, there was a connection made with Paul and the things that he was wearing as because they were so steeped in objects being connected with their magic. So there's an association made. That's their experience. I think the reality is simply God was moving powerfully through the testimony and the witness of Paul. And it wasn't about, you know, these other uh, magic potions, incantations, abracadabras. It was this one. It wasn't Artemis of the Ephesians. You know, they, they shouted that in the theater for two hours. This goddess was known worldwide, at least in the known Roman world. So this was a, this was a huge change that was happening. So it was God's power being manifested. So I don't think those items themselves um, were, you know, empowered even, but God was working through where they were at, what they believed to show his power. He does that. And that's why we see unique things happening, I think, in Ephesus. Well, I, I don't want to, I mean, there may be uh, many other questions that I, I want you to I would hopefully, after a message um, or a time together at House Church, I would hope that you and even I would leave with some questions answered and some questions unanswered that you never thought about before, but you are now. What I'm most interested in right now is what's your takeaway? Craig, what was your takeaway? In Acts 19, there is a transition with Paul's agenda. He has been arguing with the religious Jewish authorities in the synagogue for three months, but basically he had enough. So he took his disciples and those who believed into the way to a place to, to fellowship and learn. And many of these would share the good news that all could hear. And you know what, for me in life, sometimes, 
you'll be pushing a ball, trying to get something done, you know, or might be sharing your faith with a bunch of Jewish relatives and they just aren't receiving. They're not picking up what you're putting down. And then sometimes they get hostile towards you. They, you know, tell you that you're judgmental and that you're a hypocrite and these type of things. Are you sometimes, talking about your own experience? Well, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then you just, you know, you just go away. And then when you go away, you come to people like y'all, and you get love and joy and fellowship, and our spirits are united, and we're intent on one purpose purpose and hallelujah and sometimes it strengthens you enough to go back again and get beat up some more but that's what i think was going on in this chapter mm. thanks craig somebody else but what is a takeaway for you i'll call on johnny come on johnny Unless you tuned in late, man, what's your takeaway? I did tune in late. Um, but kind of the question that you were get, you were explaining about the handkerchiefs and aprons and how uh, some like commentary is talking about exactly what you said, like this is not Paul's doing because of their pagan religious background. The Ephesians are using employing are used to employing superstitious means but God accommodates his gracious work to their ignorance, how God addresses people at their needs, that even in their, their weakness and faith, God, God's grace is sufficient and it accommodates and it meets people right where they're at, regardless of maybe the state that it's in. Um, it just kind of blows my mind. And yeah. it's, it's, it's like God is willing to go to almost like what I would consider like either blasphemous or heretical or pagan in order to reach whoever he can. Yeah. But yeah. Hey, I had another question for you, Johnny. If you're willing to respond to it, you, you've got one semester left. So you're gonna be graduating. Right after you get graduated, you're gonna be married. Right after you get married, you're gonna be living together for a little while before you and uh, Mary go into some more training. Uh, if somebody says, says, Johnny, what does the road look like ahead for you? <laughs> How would you answer that question? Uh, that there is a road, but it, it's pretty foggy. You can only see the, like 10 feet ahead of you. So, but you know that you're on a road. I would say that it's uncertain. Uncertain? Does that totally Un Uncertain, but paved out. Hmm. How, does that, say that, how do you yeah. feel about uncertainties in your life? So I want to control my, all my uncertainties. <laughs> yeah. I like to control. Yeah, me too. Huh. It's going to be interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So um, now, now I'm asking the same question of the Frasers, and I'm seeing Aaron there, because Aaron, you and uh, your wife are about ready to have leave the army you're on the way out what does the road look like ahead so this is something my mom explained to me years and years ago um well over 20 years ago back when i was in high school she said you know you don't really know because at that time i was getting ready to graduate didn't really know what to experience my parents were getting ready to get stationed in germany i didn't have anything lined up I didn't know what my next plan was going to be. She said, you know, God doesn't always give us the road laid out for us on purpose. Because if we knew that, they, say for instance, if you knew 10 miles down the road, there was this horrible accident, would you even get on the road? Would you even get in the car? Would you even go down that path? But that end state after that is this amazing, glorious thing. And we have our headlights in our car. And it only shows us as far as it does for a reason. The Lord only shows us as far as he does on our road in life for a reason, because that's all that we need. We just need to continue to trust in him for what's past that, what we can't see, because we don't need to see what's going on in the darkness. He's the one that's orchestrating everything in that area. So that's the way that I see it with Heather and I as we're getting ready to embark on this next journey in our life and our, our road. 
is we only can see so far march. and yeah, we can only see quote unquote to march 1st when we actually um, step on out and move to a new bond place and everything mm -hmm. else after that is unknown and it's okay because god can see everything after march 1st he can even ever see everything prior to that we're clearer than what we can and we're just trusting in him that he is only showing us as far as those headlights because that's all that we need so that we can trust in him instead of seeing <clears throat> if had we known all the trials and tribulations we would have gone through the army would we have ever joined initially i don't know yeah i don't know and you can stop right there because sometimes that kind of an answer that's the one you gave me both heather and and uh aaron because the road other people are on affects your road mm -hmm. House Church is very precious to Dawn and I, and I think to everybody on board, to include the Frasers. I mean, they've been turning from the very beginning, but they're getting out. They're going down to Texas. You you believe you are. That's what the... <laughs> right. Right? You've got some property there. You have some heart set for ministry. And when I've asked them, well, what will this look like? And, you know, I've asked them some other things about uh, possibilities within the context of what we're doing in House Church. And the answer is... I don't know. We're, pray we're we're just praying and following the Lord. All I can say is, all right, I'm with that. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> what else can you do? What I else? really like how Johnny explained it because he said it's foggy, but he knows the road's paved out. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more with that. I know the road's paved out, but we cannot see past March 1st. So yeah. we can we just don't know. We only know what we can see. And it's that's a right. scary place to be, but we're comforted because we know Jesus has the road paved out with Jesus. So it's all going to work out. Yeah. Okay, I've got one more question I want to ask. One more person. Uh, no, I think that was, I'm not sure. Well, thank you. We were getting toward the end, but I did want to ask one more question along this line to somebody here that's been on the road uh, longer than the phrase. And hang on just a second. Yeah. We're just going to mute everybody. Yeah, here we go. All right. This, I got to unmute. That's been on the road a lot longer than the Frasers and a lot, lot longer than Johnny Miranda, but she's on a road. And that road may seem like it's the same pretty consistently, but I'd really like to know what it looks like for somebody like Joan Arnold. Well, Joan, what, is that, what does the road look like? So, so tell me, where, where's, your, where's your road headed, Joan? <laughs> Every morning, I ask myself the same question every morning but Bart what you do and everybody does but what you do during the house is you put out a challenge a challenge to us for our road right and every morning I ask myself what can I do to answer that challenge. Amen. Thank, thank you, Joan. And I can tell you what she does. She takes that little piece of gold, like Craig was talking about in the story, and that gold is in the form of some nice flowers, a card, sometimes a little gift, and thank it's you. left outside our door. And you just keep giving away what you've got. So maybe we all should be getting up each morning, however old we are, however long we've been on. <laughs> literal road the spiritual road jesus and say lord we're to today but we already know what he's going to say he's going to say come and see come and see so with that, i'm going to close with the blessing that comes out of numbers which is so beautiful that famous benediction that i use pretty frequently because it just is so fitting as they say the lord be with you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you 
and give each one of us peace on this wonderful adventure through life for his glory in Christ. Amen. We love you guys. Hello. And we'll see you from Maryland next time. All right. Bye-bye.